Pleasant. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank God for another opportunity in life that uh, has given us. And also, I'd like to welcome all our visitors and to those that are joining us in Zoom. A uh, pleasant good morning to everybody. And uh, in our midst is the family of Brother Charles. And uh, also my family is here. Welcome to my uh, blood family. And also the mother of Ariana is here. Welcome, man. Good morning. Um, and again, to everybody, a pleasant good morning to all. Um, this morning, we will be talking about um, one of the most talk about topic when it comes to um, salvation. And I'm talking about, I'm sorry. And uh, I am talking about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And again, this is one of the most talk about um, topic when it comes to salvation. And um, please bear with me. And uh, as I have so many things to say about Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. And um, I will probably pass out the slides that I prepared here this morning. Now, um, we will be answering some issues. We, we will be looking at some issues and some of the truths behind Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Now, the first question is, are we really saved by faith alone? And nothing else that a man should do to obtain salvation. Okay. So again, we're going to look into <clears throat> the issues and uh, the truths about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 in the light of the gospel. So what are the issues? Number one is by faith only or by faith alone. Now, the issues is that there are those who say that we are saved by grace through, through faith only. One just have to believe in Christ for salvation. It includes baptism. It includes, it, it excludes, sorry. It excludes baptism and other acts of man. According to our uh, um, scripture reading a while ago in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And another issue is that baptism is work. Okay. Baptism is work. It, it is considered work by those in opposition about baptism. So therefore, baptism is not necessary for salvation. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. Another issue is that man need not do anything for salvation. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Again, we go back, or they go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you are saved, through faith. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Man cannot do anything, any work, and doesn't have to do anything, any work, <clears throat> to be saved, to merit salvation, because Jesus already did everything for us. So those are the opposition, the issues regarding Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, with regards to salvation. That you don't have to do anything. Okay. Now, what are the facts? We're going to delve into the facts, delve into the truths behind Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Number one, who is the author of Ephesians? It's Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was the author of Ephesians. Now, as the writer of Ephesians, you know, does Apostle Paul know what he was saying? Well, of course, he know what he was saying. And if we want to know the meaning behind Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we need to go to Apostle Paul, right? We need to go to Apostle Paul. Now, when Apostle Paul wrote any of his epistles, it was based, number one, on God. And number two, it was based on his personal experiences, right? And when he wrote Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he was writing part of his experience when he met the Lord on the way to Damascus, okay? When in Ephesians chapter 8 and 9, uh, sorry, uh, Acts chapter 8 and 9, when he was on the road to Damascus, you can read the conversion of Apostle Paul. Okay? So he was writing part of Ephesians chapter 2, part of his experience when he met the Lord. Okay? 
Now, the question is, how was he saved? How was Apostle Paul saved? Now, was it by grace, through faith? Well, of course. Of course, no doubt about it. The Bible tells us, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, we are saved by grace. That is true. Okay. Was it by faith? Of course. But was it by grace, through faith alone? That's the issue. That's the question. Now, we will see uh, the answer to that as we progress in our lesson. So Apostle Paul was the author. Another fact is, was Apostle Paul baptized? Yes. You can read that in his conversion in Acts chapter 9. Okay. Now again, as author of Ephesians chapter 2, okay, if Apostle Paul's intent in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, was to disregard baptism as necessity for salvation, then my question is, why was he baptized? Okay. Why was Apostle Paul baptized? Now, let us go back to the account of Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, so we can have a glimpse. And then he got up, and he was baptized. This particular verse pertains to Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Okay. Now, clearly, Apostle Paul was baptized in Acts chapter 9 during the conversion when he met the Lord on his way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus. But what was he doing before he got baptized? Okay. It is important to know, what was he doing okay, before the, the, the time that he was baptized? In verse 9 and 10, uh, verse 9 and 11 of Acts chapter 9, we can see what was he doing. And for three days, he was blind and he was fasting. He was fasting and he was praying for three days. Remember that. For three days, he was fasting. And it was customary at that time, when you fast, you will pray to God. Okay, in verse 11, Ananias found him, he was praying. So he was fasting and he was praying to God. Okay. So why was he was praying? Why, was he was, why Paul was fasting in the first place? He was repenting to God. He was asking God for forgiveness. For if Paul did not believe in Jesus Christ, he would not have been baptized, right? He would not have been baptized. You see, Paul believed. He believed in Christ when he met Christ on the way, on the road to Damascus. He believed in Jesus Christ. He already had faith in Jesus Christ at that time. Now, if he had been already saved by faith, at that time, then my question is, why was there a need for him to be baptized? Okay. Because it was a necessity for man's salvation. Now we go now to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Okay. It is actually the same scenario, but this time he was in front of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the court, the council court. Okay. And he said, and now Ananias told him, now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Again, if Paul was already saved when he met Jesus Christ, when he had faith, when he met Jesus Christ, then why was there a need for him to be baptized? And why would Ananias tell him to get up and wash your sins away? Be baptized and calling on the name of the Lord. If baptism is not a necessity for man's salvation. Okay. Now, let us go to Acts chapter 2. Okay. Now, the things that I'm going to point out in Acts chapter 2 are connected with all of the things that I've presented to you. Okay. So that we can get a clear, clear understanding of what calling on the name of the Lord means. Okay. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, the, Peter, uh, uh, the, the people, sorry, the people ask Peter and the apostles, and everyone, oh, Peter and the apostles, tell the people, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The apostles were addressing the people. Now my question is, did the people understood what the apostles were telling them to call upon the name of the Lord? Now apparently, they did not understand what was the meaning of calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because in verse 37, of Acts chapter 2, the people ask the apostles, brothers, what shall we do to be saved? Now, 
a few verses before that, a few verses before that, the apostles told them already, calling on the name of the Lord, call on the name of the Lord, but they did not understand what that means. And they asked the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now, when Peter answered them, he did not revert to Acts, 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 6, uh, 21. He did not revert, he did not go back to Acts 2, 21. But he clearly and specifically answered the question by going to Acts 2.38. And what was, what was the answer of Peter? Peter told the people, repent and be baptized for the remissions of your sins. And that was the meaning of calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? So if calling on the name of the Lord is just saying a prayer or you know, asking God to come into my life as my Lord and personal Savior, then Paul would not have been baptized. And Paul, he would, you know, when he met the Lord again, he would already be saved at that time when he met the Lord. But no. Ananias told him, get up, wash away your sins, be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. Because he was not saved at that time. He needed to be immersed in the water so that his sins will be washed away. So therefore, calling on the name of the Lord is done by repenting. Again, if you go back to Acts chapter 22, in Acts chapter 9, Paul was praying. He was praying to God. If calling on the name of the Lord is praying to God, asking God, Lord, please come into my life as my Lord and personal Savior. And Paul was already praying to God for three days. And yet he was not yet saved. He was told by Ananias to get up, wash his sins away, be baptized, and calling on the name of the Lord. Okay. Now, of course, if you don't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the first place, you will not be baptized because you don't believe in him in the first place. Right? So why would I be baptized and be obedient to someone that I don't believe in? Right? So number one is, of course, you, you have to have faith. Okay? Now, another fact, faith is work. Faith is good work. Those who oppose that baptism is work, do you know that faith is work, according to the Bible? If they disregard baptism as work, but they go for faith, the Bible tells us that faith is work. Okay? Faith is work. But of course, number one, it is imperative for every one of us to have faith. Because according to Hebrews chapter 11, it is impossible to please God without faith. That's number one. You must believe in God. You must believe in Jesus Christ. Okay? You must believe in Him. You must have that faith. Okay? Now, the next question would be, can a person do anything without Jesus and be saved? Can you do anything without Jesus Christ? No. Of course not. Can a person do anything on his own and be saved? Of course not. Of course not. That's where Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 comes in. Especially the last few words in verse 9. That says, no one can boast. Okay? If you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, in the last part, it says, so that no one can boast. It simply means that I need Jesus Christ. That you need Jesus Christ into your life because without him, without the shedding of the blood, without him being crucified on the cross, you and I cannot be saved whatever you do. That's what it means. So that no one can boast. If I can save myself alone without the need for the blood of Jesus Christ, then I can mock God and say to God, hey God, I don't need you. You see, what you did is nothing because I can now save myself. So we are putting a mockery to what God did and what Jesus Christ did. That's the meaning of Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. So that no one can boast, meaning that you and I, we can never be saved apart from Jesus Christ. Amen? You can never be saved. So that you can never boast. That's what it means. Okay. Now, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, 
I will give you the big reveal in a few moments. Okay? They contend that baptism is work. Oh, that's, that's, a good, that's good work. That's work. The Bible said, not of work. But let me tell you, and you will see the big reveal in a few moments. Faith is work. Faith is work. Then they ask him, they ask the Lord Jesus Christ, what must we do? Okay, what must we do to do the works of God requires? What must we do? They asked Jesus Christ when they were fed. Because Jesus Christ was talking about, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. And the people, because they were filled, they were fed by Jesus Christ. They were looking for Jesus Christ for, for bread and to be filled again. And then they asked Jesus Christ, what must we do to do the work God requires? Because Jesus Christ told them, don't work for food that is spoiled or spoils. Okay. And then they asked the Lord, what must we do to do the works of God requires? Now, here's the big reveal. John 6, 29. Jesus answered them, this is God's work. In ISV, International Standard Version, to believe in the one whom he has sent. New King James Version, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he sent. In Good News Translation, Jesus answered, What God wants you to do is believe in the one he sent. So the people were asking, Lord, what should we do? What must we do? And the Lord said, This is what you should do. Jesus said, Have faith. Believe in God. When Jesus said faith or uh, believe, he's talking about faith. Okay? In the Greek word, that's pisteo, from the root word pistis, which is faith. So Jesus Christ, when he mentioned the word believe, he was mentioning about faith. The same faith in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? Now, in Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, listen to this. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the pleasure of his goodness and the work of what? And the work of faith with power. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of what? Your work of faith. So faith is work. Something that the person must do. Just like baptism. Just like repentance. I cannot repent for you. In substitution, no. I cannot be baptized in, in the place of, uh, in lieu of, uh, or in place of brother uh, Ed. No. He must be the one to be immersed. I cannot do it for him. Same with faith. Same with faith. It is a work. Faith is a work of good. It's a good work. Now, what's my point in all of this? Faith is actually work. Faith is actually work. Good work that is. If people oppose baptism because it is work, then faith is work as well, as we have seen. There must be something that a man must do in order for that person to receive the grace of God. Yes, the grace of God is freely given. We are saved by grace, no doubt. It's written in the Bible. Do I believe it? Yes, I believe that. Okay. But that's not all what it is saying. Okay. You need to do something. If you, want to go from, if you want to go from point A to point B, you need to do something. If I want to go from here and I want to go to, uh, to, the, to Seafood City, then I need to do something. I need to drive a car or I need to uh, ride a bus or I need to hitch, you know, to go there, right? You have to do something. You cannot go from here to other point by just standing and doing nothing. And same with the grace of God. God did everything for all of us. You need to do your part. God did this part, then man, we must do our part to be saved. Okay. Repentance. Repentance is necessary. Now, quite interestingly, 
when people talk about salvation, whether those who oppose baptism or those who don't oppose baptism, they all agree that we need to repent. Right? We all need to repent of our sins. Now, the, the, a Christian person will tell somebody that they need to repent so that they can be forgiven. But they will not mention about baptism. You need to have faith, but you need something to do. And what is that? You need to repent. Then you are doing something. I thought you don't need to do anything. Why are you repenting? Why are you asking them to repent? Don't repent. No, you have to repent. No, don't repent. No, you have to repent. But what is repentance? Repentance is a change. It's not only a, it's not only a recognition of sins. Okay? It is a change of man's total being. Heart, mind, spirit, and strength from sin and self and becoming obedient to God's will. It is accepting the will of God. That's what obedience means. And obedience uh, and repentance, it is mentioned in the Bible all over. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Acts 3.19, repent, then turn to God. Now, let's take baptism for a while. Let's put it aside for a while. Now, here's my question. Don't think of baptism. Here's my question. If all of you have faith in God, okay, and pray to God to come into your life and you know, accept Him as your Lord and personal Savior, but, but, without repenting, okay? You have faith. I believe in God. Without repenting, do you think you will be saved? Do you think you will be saved? Well, I know you know the answer to that because I know you are all intelligent. Right? Can you be saved without even repenting, even though you have faith in God? Revelation 21, 27, the answer to that is this. And nothing that defiles or profanes or is unwashed will ever enter heaven. So if a person, even though he believes in God, but never repented, that person is still what my brother-in-law always say, dirty. That person is still dirty. You know? And the Bible said, and nothing that defiles or nothing that is dirty or profanes or is unwashed will ever enter heaven. Now, you see, we read repentance in the Bible, across the Bible, and we do repentance. But somehow, we are blind to think and to see baptism. Repent and... Okay, let's go to the other verse. See, we jump okay, as if when we read baptism, as if it's like a disease. You know, people don't like it. Oh, I don't like that. It's like a disease. Why? Why people reacted so much you know, not, 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 not an anger, so much opposition to baptism. It's in the Bible. It's written in the Bible. Okay? And then people would, would, would uh, go to the extreme and they will, uh, they will put a what if scenario. Brother Mike, what if the person is in the desert? There's no water. What if the person is up there in the air and all of a sudden, he wanted to accept the Lord and there's no water. Then jump. Now, what if the person is out there in the space, you know, in, in the spacecraft, hovering over the earth? And what if the person suddenly met an accident? He was hit by a car and he was, ah, I'm dying. And nobody there to, you know, to, to, to pray for him, the Lord's prayer or the sinner's prayer. You know, people would put up with so many what-if scenarios. See? Just to discredit, just to oppose what the Lord said. Right? Now, whose fault is it? Brother Charles, it's your fault. Brother Derek, it's your fault, Brother Rex. It's your fault. Brother Calvin, I know you're watching. It's your fault. Now, 
you know, to be honest, whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? You know, Revelation 2.21, the Lord said, I gave you time. The Lord said, I gave her time to repent, to change her inner self and her sinful way of thinking, but she has no desire. We have no desire of really accepting the Lord because of our, what we call tigas ulo. You know, our, uh, uh, how do you say that? Huh? Stubborn or hard, hard head. <laughs> hard headed. Or what the Bible said, uh, our heart is callous. Right? So because we don't want to repent, we don't want to accept the Lord, but the Lord said, I have given her time. The Lord has given us all the time in this world. From the moment that you have this ability to think, the ability to discern what, what is right and what is wrong, the Lord had given you the time. And yet, when you're about to die, Lord, save me. And then people would come up, accept the Lord and you are saved. Is that how the justice of the Lord works? Okay. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about repentance. Before Apostle Paul went to 8 and 9, he talks about repentance. Okay. Reading the Bible is about context. Brother Derek always mentioned that to us in our uh, ambassador's class. You read up, you read down, you read in between, and you even have to read a few chapters before the chapter to understand. It's about context. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, it's about context. Okay? You have to read before and the after. And you have to go to Apostle Paul to understand what Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 is all about. Now again, in Ephesians chapter 2, does it talk about repentance? Can you see the word repentance? No. No. Can you see the word baptism? No. So that's why they say, oh, you see, there's no baptism. And that, that's a good word. But you don't see repentance, but people will repent. But there's no repentance in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. But people would advocate that you have to repent to be saved. But where is Ephesians in chapter, uh, in, uh, where is repentance in chapter 2 uh, uh, um, in that book? Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, 1 and 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Can you see repentance there? Of course, there's no word repentance. But the implication. Okay, that's why I mentioned about what repentance is. Okay, is, not, is this not repentance? Okay. You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live. You are facing and walking this way with sins. And now because you realize that you are a sinner, you are now facing this way and walking this way towards God. It is not, is that not repentance? That is repentance. Apostle Paul was talking about repentance before he went to verses 8 and 9. Now, 3 and 4, also, uh, all of us also lived among them at one time. Gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. You see, before we are living with them, gratifying the flesh. But now, because we learn that we are sinners and we learn that we need Jesus Christ, now we are facing the Lord and we are now HHWWWG. What does it mean? H H holding hands while walking with God. When I was walking with my wife, I was holding her hand. My daughter said, "Oh, H H W W. H H W W. Yeah." And my daughter said, "Holding hands while walking." And now, when you face the Lord, you are now H H W W W G. Holding hands while walking with God. That is repentance. So Ephesians chapter 2, Apostle Paul talks about repentance. Now, where is baptism? In the book of Ephesians, right? 
Was Paul talking about baptisms when he wrote Ephesians? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now again, Paul was baptized. Yes, he was baptized. Now here's another question. Were the Ephesian brethren uh, baptized into Christ? Were they, the Ephesians, where Apostle Paul wrote his book to them, were they baptized? Do they even know about the baptism of Jesus Christ? Now, let's go and find out. In Acts chapter 9, 1 to 5, when Apostle Paul, in his third missionary journey, went to Ephesus, he found several brethren. And Apostle Paul asked them about which baptism they received. And they told Apostle Paul, we received the baptism of John. Then Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they did what? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Apostle Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 2, they were already immersed. When he wrote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the brethren were already baptized. Because remember, when Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was already in prison in Rome. And he already went to Ephesus in his third missionary journey. Okay? So the people that he was writing to, they were already being baptized. You get the point? You get the point. Okay. Now, if baptism were nowhere in the horizon of the Ephesian brethren and nowhere in the mind of Apostle Paul, then why was Paul baptized? And why did Paul mention baptism to the Ephesian brethren in his missionary journey? And why did the Ephesian brethren were baptized? Okay. Now, did Apostle Paul talk about baptism? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body. There is one body. Yes, indeed. There is one body, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is established and the same church that he died for. And all true Christians around the world compose of the one body of the church or the, the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. Is there one spirit? Indeed, there is one spirit. The same self spirit of Christ that is in the body which all the members live and act. Is there one hope? Of course, there is one hope in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. There is one hope, an inheritance, an inheritance in heaven. And then in verse 5, one Lord. Is there one Lord? Do we have one Lord? Absolutely. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, There is grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one Lord. Do we have one faith? There is one faith. Absolutely. There is one faith. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, Since I heard about your faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one faith. There's no other faith. Hebrews 11, 6. And then do we have one baptism? Ephesians 4 and 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Do we have one baptism? First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Absolutely, we have one baptism. This is the, this is the type of baptism that saved us. The type of baptism that saves us, the immersion, immersion, immersion. Not sprinkling, not pouring, immersion in water. You see, Apostle Paul was talking about repentance. Apostle Paul was talking about baptism in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians. If you will read the book of Ephesians, you will see the implication about repentance, turning yourself to God, and about baptism. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, Ephesians chapter 5, sorry, 24 to 26. Jesus Christ talked about the church and the church cleansing her by the washing with water. What does it mean when he talked about washing with water? Now, to understand that, how does one become a member of the church? You go to Acts chapter 2, 38 to 42. Repent and be baptized, and those that were baptized were added to his church. So you became a member of the church when you repent and you submit yourself through baptism. You become a member of the church. So Jesus Christ were was talking about the church. And also, it meant that all members of the Lord's church were cleansed. How they were cleansed? They were cleansed by washing with water. What does it mean? You go again to Acts 22, verse 16. 
The verse that we read a while ago when Ananias told Paul, what are you waiting for? Stand up. Wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. And he was referring to baptism. Now, washing with water, if you will read many scholars, commentaries, they would all agree that Apostle Paul was talking about water baptism. And we learn all of these things. Through what? Through the word. Because without these written words of God, we will never know the truth. First Peter chapter 1, 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed. You have been born again. How are you, or were you born again? You go to John chapter 3. You go to Acts chapter 2. You go to Acts chapter 20, 22. Acts chapter 9. You go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, as they say, is the book of conversion. And it says, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Through what? Through the living and enduring word of God. We were washed away by sins through the word, by learning of the truth. The truth is in the Bible, through Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That is why Ephesians chapter 2, when Paul said to them, for by grace you are saved, he was just reiterating to the Ephesian brethren what they did. And what they did is when they repented, they were baptized into Christ, they accepted the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they became one body. You see, brethren and friends, baptism is a necessity for our salvation. And as I have pointed out, we will learn the truth through reading the Bible, the word of truth. The only thing that you will lose if you get baptized into Christ is your sins. That is the only thing that you will lose. And you will gain so much and many more. Now, I want to encourage you to study the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, it does not exclude repentance. It, it, uh, it doesn't also exclude loving one another. It talks about loving one another. It talks about repentance. It talks about forgiving, forgiveness. It talks about uh, baptism. It only confirms the great mercy, grace, and love of God through Jesus Christ for all of us. Nothing that I can do or nothing that I can do can ever be good enough for my salvation without Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us, for there's no name given under heaven in which we shall be saved. So you and I cannot be saved without Jesus Christ. Now, brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Now, may I invite those who want to be saved and accept God's free gift of eternal life with him. I want you to come forward, repent of your sins, and be baptized into Christ. And finally, I will leave you this final word of the Lord. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So we all stand as we sing the song of invitation. God bless you all.